Aloha, my name is Josh Green, and I'm your moderator and host in Healthcare in Hawaii. This is a program we've developed here at Think Tech over the last several months to better explore the nuances of healthcare in our dear state. We've had multiple speakers with great and excellent backgrounds. We started with Beth Geesting talking about healthcare transformation in the state of Hawaii. We've met with senior vice presidents from HMSA, the dean of the medical school, the head of the health insurance, uh, health information exchange, and so many other wonderful guests. Today we're going to take on a slightly different tone. We're going to talk specifically about Queen's Hospital and the excellent leadership role that they've taken on statewide here in Hawaii. Today my guest is Dr. Whitney Lim, a surgeon, so a physician here like myself in the state, who's working on an interesting new project called the Clinically Integrated Physician Network out of Queens. But without, uh, without dwelling on a single issue, when we have someone with this much experience like Dr. Lim, I'd like to also delve into the many things that Queen's Hospital's been doing for our state. So without further ado, Dr. Lim. Hi, Josh. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, because people like to know how a doctor got into healthcare transformation. How did you start? Did you start as a... Okay. A, well, let's see. Uh, I grew up here. Um, in fact, I went to Kapalama School and Kalakaua School. Um, I graduated from Yolani, mm -hmm. and then I went to the East Coast. I went to Stanford for my undergraduate work and uh, went to medical school at UCLA. And I thought, well, I want to be a, a general surgeon, and I'm the only uh, per member in my family who's a physician, and I knew I wanted to come back to Hawaii. So I came back here for my general surgery residency, and during my residency, I had a chance to work with Dr. Livingston Wong, father of the transplant program in Hawaii, and he said, well, would you like to be a transplant surgeon? I said, sure. And uh, this was back in 1987, 88, when they were just coming out with new medications for transplants. And I thought, this is a really exciting field. So I went away, did my transplant fellowship, came back, and started practicing in 1991. And for the next 20 years, I practiced as a general surgeon mm -hmm. as a, and as a transplant surgeon. And what I saw was that the ch healthcare was changing. It was no longer about just taking care of individual patients. It was important to take care of the individual patients, but it was also important to think of the patient as a part of a community and to try to, and to keep that in mind, to try to improve a system of care and to contain the cost of care for that system. And Queens created a position called uh, Vice President of Clinical Integration. And so I, uh, I, I took that position in January of 2012. See, this is so relevant, uh, Whitney, to what we've been talking about. So I'm so pleased to have you here today because over the last few weeks, we've spent a lot of time exploring what does it mean to, in our state, have a patient-centered medical home program. Right. And we've, we've talked about how that's an integrated care model around the patient at the center. Right. And we've talked a little bit about the medical neighborhood and how it's uh, bringing in specialists like yourself and our cardiology friends mm -hmm. and endocrinologists and so many people to get more of a kind of a holistic um, human approach to our patient. But now I can see the link as you begin to describe it uh, from the perspective of a very advanced uh, specialist physician in yourself and a transplant physician now working on clinical integration for Queens. And you seem to be kind of a reflection of Queens because for many years, Queens had its mission mm -hmm. and it was to take care in the best way of people in a compassionate way in Honolulu. But now Queens seems to be integrating care more broadly. Let's touch on a few things. Um, now, if I'm not mistaken, a year or two ago, Queens took over the transplant responsibility statewide. Is right. that right? Right. Um, so I think it was December 16th, uh, 2011. Okay. On, on a Friday at 5 p.m., Hawaii Medical Center East shut down, and the transplant program closed. And there were 400 some patients on the wait list who, if essentially, uh, lost their place on the wait list. In fact, there was no wait list. When Aloha Airline uh, went into bankruptcy, people could get on Hawaiian Airline. But that wasn't the case when the uh, transplant program shut down. Right. People on the wait list couldn't go anywhere. They could try to go to the West Coast and be listed on the West Coast. But for, the, for most of them, that just wasn't an option. Right. So um, working with Queens um, 
we working with Karen Shields, VP of Surgery, and Art Ushijima, the uh, CEO, mm -hmm. uh, we received immediate support uh, for the transplant program. We started, before Christmas, started applying to UNOS, that's the National Regulatory Agency for Transplant, submitted a thick book of applica uh, applications. And within, I want to say, three months, we, uh, Dr. Linda Wong performed the first liver transplant at Queens. And since then, uh, we've done, I want to say, close to 80 transplants. And I, I've had the extreme good fortune of meeting some of those people that you pulled through very dark times as patients. And it really, I mean, it's been extraordinary to watch Queens step up to the plate and take on that responsibility. Yeah. But it didn't stop there. So Queens then decided to make um, an additional commitment in the hospital in acquiring the hospital maybe you should give our our viewers a little bit of perspective on what that means as okay. well okay so you're talking about queens west yes and what we're doing is uh we've been uh, working very hard at uh, preparing for the opening of queens west and it's going to be uh, different from uh, our punch bowl campus in that this is going to be a community hospital right. it's going to be serving the community the west community and um, it will be opening, um, I believe, the last Tuesday uh, in late in late in sp in spring of 2014. Hopefully, sometime in March Great. of 2014. And this seems to be another way that Queens has decided it's going to integrate care. In this case, on Oahu, right? So, how will it work? Will the physicians from Queens have a responsibility and role over at West, or will there be new physicians and a totally new staff? What can people expect? I think what we will see is a medical staff that will consist of some of the physicians who used to practice out at West. Yes. Um, they'll be welcome back, and there'll be some physicians from the downtown campus who will go out to West. And additionally, uh, we will have physicians from the mainland to help us staff the hospital. Interesting. So really, you're bringing both some of the strengths of Queens uh, the main Queens campus out to West and also bringing in new right. new folks to also help right. us. And I want to share with you uh, some uh, an ongoing experience. Um, every two weeks we have a meeting of physicians and it's called the West Physician Implementation Council. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we sit ar around the dinner table and we have physicians from the various different specialties general surgery, internal medicine, ER, radiology, urology, and we sit and we talk, we plan. We say, you know, I'm a urologist, this is the type of service my specialty will present. Are there questions from um, different, we'll ask the ER physician, the anesthesiologist, and we'll, we'll ask them if they have any concerns and anything that we need to address in our planning. And we do this every two weeks. and and we. And this gives us a chance to get to know each other and to plan for the opening. When it opens, it's going to everything's going to be open. It's all or none. The ER is going to be open. The OR is going to be the open. The ICU, the floors, it'll be open. Very unlike the health insurance exchange, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, right. I, right. Hate to, I hate to poke fun at those guys <laughs> today, but it's, I think it's this is very helpful. Okay, so we we take a look, and you have evolved into this role as the senior vice president at Queens. Uh, you're a transplant surgeon, you're involved in the surgeries, you kept that program going, and now we have a new campus, and you're integrating with these physicians. But there's even more than that that Queen seems to be doing. And I, I say all these things to preface where we're going in our second segment, our second 15 minutes about the clinically integrated physician network. What about the Big Island? I, I now understand, and, and we've had some conversations on the show previously, that Queens also has an interest in care on the Big Island. Can you give us a short update about that? Uh, my understanding is that Queens is in active discussion with, the, uh, with North, North Hawaii Hospital. Okay. Uh, beyond that, I don't know the details. That's fine, because I, as the Big Island Senator, I get to hear a little, uh, you know, kind of, a little nibbles of information and and it's been very interesting over the years queen sends some providers over to big island which mm -hmm. we're very appreciative of because we're very short on specialists as right. we all know uh, but also this expanded role in other parts of the state in other counties interests me because it seems to me that this is going to give queens the capacity to integrate care in ways that only hawaii pacific health has done mm -hmm. historically mm -hmm. and so queens is taking on it appears kind of a new approach. Is that fair to say? That is. And, you know, additionally, and we'll probably talk about this later, I think 
what we're doing is we're expanding from a medical center to, tr to a true hospital health system. Yes. We're expanding beyond our campus, and we want to care for the community with beyond just the boundaries of, uh, of the medical center. Maybe um, just, just so people get an idea, how big is Queens right now? How many beds are at Queens overall? About 500 beds. There are 1,200 physicians on the medical staff. Wow. And they are comprised of what? Are they mostly specialists or? Very much so. Um, most of our, uh, Queens for the most part has been a tertiary quaternary center. Yes. And uh, the physicians who practice at the hospital are surgical specialists or, the, or uh, internal medicine uh, specialists. And they, um, uh, w we are, increasingly trying to increase our primary care base. Yes, and I think that that speaks to this this conversation that we've all been having about the patient-centered medical home and the medical neighborhood and how best to, you know, how best to approach that. I can tell you that I've had very good personal experiences with Queens. When I had a hernia operation, <laughs> it was excellent to have our, one of our GI friends uh, fix my hernia and, um, and with great care and great uh, nursing support. Uh, but so often when I'm on Big Island taking care of individuals, just this last weekend I had a, a really sweet older guy um, come in with chest pains mm -hmm. and within in maybe two minutes after I finished my examination, I was able to get an EKG over to one of our Queens cardiologists, mm -hmm. Dr. Mm -hmm. Kogan, who immediately uh, reviewed the EKG, gave me his opinion. We arranged uh, transport through Queens quite seamlessly, and that gentleman was getting a cardiac catheterization uh, within a couple hours. And uh, to be frank, it you know, in many ways it saved his life. And it had been months and months leading up to this, uh, but with, uh, with this pain that he had and the mm. suffering he had, but within just minutes after coming to a very rural little ER on the Big Island, Queens was able to help mm. me capture his care. So I think when people think of Queens, sometimes patients go to Queens, but in this case, it seems like Queens is now mm. going to the patients. Is that what we're seeing from Queens? Yes, yes we are. And uh, we do have um, uh, physicians who work with uh, Molokai physicians, and, and we have telemedicine services. And um, for my transplant patients, sometimes we'll we'll have uh, I'll see them via video conference, and it's a lot cheaper for them to uh, have a visit in that manner than to have to spend a couple hundred dollars to fly to Honolulu, see me for. 10, 15 minutes and go back. It, it's very interesting. I think uh, many of these things you've touched on already underscore the changing nature of our healthcare system. Yes. So why don't we do this? Uh, let's take our first break, and then when we come back, we'll dive into the CIPN, the Clinically yeah. Integrated Physician Network, and begin to describe what that means to our patients in the state, what it'll mean to physicians here in our state, and our healthcare system in general. Okay. Sound good? I'm Josh Green, your host at Healthcare in Hawaii, today with Dr. Whitney Lim, transplant surgeon, homegrown doc, and now Senior Vice President at Queens Hospital. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a Senior Executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashen. See you next time. Aloha, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, uh, Josh Green, physician on Big Island, state senator. Today I'm lucky enough to have a really excellent uh, guest, Dr. Whitney Lim, who grew up here in Hawaii, uh, went off to school at Stanford and then UCLA, became a transplant surgeon, and is now the senior vice president of clinical integration at Queens Hospital. 
In our first 15 minutes, uh, Dr. Lim was able to express some of the things that Queen is doing, Queens is doing for us as a state, taking up the mantle of transplant surgery for all, all patients and all of our needs, but also reaching out, uh, reopening the hospital in the coming months over across uh, Oahu at HMC West, looking into uh, providing additional care on Big Island, and there I'm sure will be announcements in the near future about that uh, partnership with North Hawaii Community Hospital, but also looking at clinically integrated care in our state. Now, a very interesting phenomenon has been developing out of Queens, and that's the formation of the CIPN, and Whitney's leading that charge. It's the Clinically Integrated Physician Network. It's going to be very valuable, it appears, to both physicians locally and to our patients. So I wanted to have him here on our show today to really expound on what that's gonna look like. So, Dr. Lim, could you tell us a little bit about the CIPN and how it's beginning? Okay, so let me tell you what the goal is. Um, the goal is to have the physician, to have Queens work with the physicians to create a network that addresses the triple aim, triple aim okay. improve the quality of care mm -hmm. for the community, decrease the cost of care, and improve the health of the population. Got it. And um, for, for 150 some years, Queens has been dependent on the private practice physicians, and it's done. It's thrived on that. Um, but what's happening is that with healthcare reform, physicians and the hospitals have to work in a much close, closer relationship, right. and hence the need to have a clinically integrated network. You, you mentioned earlier, just before we get deep into this, that there were 1,200 physicians, mostly specialists, at Queens. And on previous programs, I've been able to tease out of some of our um, you know, health administrators that we really only have about 3,500 to 4,000 active physicians statewide. So you've got this incredible group of, of highly professional, terrific specialists, and now you're going to be integrating the right. primary care guys. Is that right. what you're describing? Right. Some, I should note that some of the 1,200 physicians are primary care physicians. Um, but yes, there's a need to actually integrate the specialists, the primary care physicians, and the hospital to, to provide the highest level of care so possible. St start us off on how this began as an idea. We had the Affordable Care Act come down, right? And right. I understand there were lots of things that um, I wouldn't say concerned hospitals, but really made them kind of perk up their ears and say, okay, healthcare is changing. So what did that, what, what was it about the Affordable Care Act and healthcare changes in general that got Queens into this more integrated game? Well, I think, um, again, there, everyone understands that, you know, we need to bend the cost curve, right? right? And, so, and, but yet we can't sacrifice cost for quality. Right. And, and to really improve uh, the quality and decrease cost, you have to make sure that that you keep the population healthy. That would be the best way to um, to minimize costs in the future. So addressing the triple aim is what um, uh, uh, got us interested. And frankly, the payers are saying, the insurance companies are saying, we can't just keep you keep paying you to do more. We want you, we'll pay you for providing service that's of value right. to the community. And we heard that at great length with um, Hilton Rathel, who it gave a very good uh, overview of Queen's, uh, I'm sorry, HMSA's approach uh, in dealing with physicians and how they were doing and focusing on the same thing. But let me ask you maybe the tougher question is, it almost seems counterintuitive uh, if the insurer asks Queen's, who is providing specialist care at its highest level, providing transplants for people who have had you know, kidney disease that's gone too far or liver disease that is irrecoverable, um, to provide care for people who need surgeries. That's what Queens has been about. And now the insurer is telling you, we have to keep patients out of the hospital and we want you to participate in it. Mm -hmm. Did that did that make uh, Art's last few hairs stand up? <laughs> what, <laughs> no, what, what happened? <laughs> I think uh, what the insurers are saying is that we want to pay you for the uh, surgeries that need to be done. Okay. And once they're uh, completed, we want to make sure that the patient recovers in the shortest time period uh, possible with minimal complications, uh, with, minim with a, a minimal the length of stay, and be able to get back to work sooner. Got it. So, so, so the idea is, yes, if an operation is indicated, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for it. 
Um, but please make sure that the, the, the complication rate is minimized, that the re-emission rate is in, minimized. So yeah, this, so we're saying, we've always, see the, the, the irony also of it is, is Queens, always, Queens has always done such a good job. I mean, they had, you guys had me out of the hospital three hours after I had my, <laughs> my hernia repaired, right? So um, I appreciate the efficiency and the top quality care, but it seems as though the approach nationwide now is when they look at the healthcare providers, people like you and me, they're asking us to do every possible thing in an efficiency way so that we can squeeze better care out of the same healthcare dollar or maybe right. even a, sl a smaller healthcare dollar. So after one of our patients at Queens uh, has their surgery, we want to make sure that they get, I guess in this case, follow up from providers, from primary care physicians that will be integrated into the Queens system. That, that's exactly right. And so I would um, take it back um, Let's take a step back. Good. Let's say a patient needs to have a hip replacement. Okay. Um, in this integrated network, we've essentially created a patient-centered medical home neighborhood. Mm -hmm. In this neighborhood, you have primary care physicians, you have specialists, you have a rehab service, you have social workers, you have a hospital. So um, if, this, uh, if Mr. Wong needs to have a hip replacement, right. um, he sh won't go directly to the orthopedic surgeon. What he'll do is he'll go to his primary care physician, and the primary care physician will do the necessary tests and say, yes, uh, surgery is appropriate, and yes, you're in optimal condition to have the procedure. The primary care physician will then say, I'm going to send Mr. Wong to this orthopedic surgeon who uh, has a good record. I know that he has a uh, he, he has certain volume in uh, threshold that's been reached, and he's had low complication rate. So he goes to the orthopedic surgeon, who then says, "Okay, this patient, Mr. Wong, is fully prepared for surgery. I'll now I'm going to schedule the surgery at the hospital. The hospital will have a team of anesthesiologists, nurses, OR techs." who are dedicated to hip, uh, hip replacements. Right. And they will take care of um, Mr. Wong, and guidelines will be followed yes. in the hospital. Uh, there will be protocols for rehab, and following discharge, Mr. Wong will be given appointments to see the therapist, to see the surgeon, and to see the primary care physician. Communication will be shared with the members of the neighborhood. So, what it sounds to me that you're trying to get at is, though the system still contains the same players, the same physicians, the same outpatient doc, the same surgeons, the word integration actually is important here because historically maybe we didn't communicate well enough and patients fell through the cracks or they didn't get to there in this case. Mr. Wong didn't get to his rehabilitation fast enough and maybe he didn't get better as, as quickly, he didn't get back to work, or right. God forbid uh, he didn't get good follow-up care and we didn't notice an infection early. Right. And in all of those circumstances, there was much more suffering for this patient. There also was probably a lot more cost if he had to be readmitted to the hospital right. and so on and so forth. So the CIPN, the Clinically Integrated Physician Network, is meant to integrate the care for Mr. Wong or for right. the patient in general uh, much, much more than it was ever integrated. Is that? That is correct. And I think it's also an open system in that Mr. Wong's um, physicians are in this neighborhood um, and they chose to be in the, in the neighborhood. And okay. Mr. Wong can have choices uh, with, within the neighborhood. He can choose different specialists. The primary care physician may say, Mr. Wong, if you want to have hip replacement, these three surgeons uh, have the best records, you know, uh, best uh, outcomes, and choose one. And so let me, um, let me ask you kind of a basic question about the CIPN. How will, how will physicians choose to be involved? Uh, how are you reaching out to people out of the starting gate here? Um, we are asking them to uh, consider joining us uh, because, uh, and think about improving patient care, decreasing cost. Uh, we will, they will also be incentivized uh, for, uh, uh, based, they'll be incentivized for hitting certain quality metrics. Initially, there'll be process measures, and then there'll be outcome measures. Tell me what a process measure is for those who might not know. Sure. So uh, think about um, going to a basketball game, mm -hmm. right? 
and you see a guy shoot a basket, right. all right, the process would be the form that he uses, whether he flicks his wrist back, is his elbow straight, and does he um, uh, extend um, uh, his, his, his uh, elbow when he shoots. The outcome is whether the basket go, the ball goes in or not. Okay. okay, so process is the steps that you take, oh, yeah. uh, and the outcome is whether you, you have the result or not. So you're saying in the first phase of the, the clinically integrated physician network, people are going to get accustomed to this more global system where they're partnering with physicians, where they're relying on Queens to provide the excellent care in the hospital, but they have a natural process between uh, specialists, nurse practitioners, in practice, all of the other services, the rehabilitation and so on. But later down the road, we'll get our rewards because uh, patients will have gotten better care, and I guess you mentioned earlier that maybe it will be more cost effective because we'll have right. shorter stays and so on. Right, so, so some of the uh, process measures may involve uh, how physicians communicate with each other. Did Dr. Lim send his patient to a, a second physician with the proper notes, uh, sharing the, all the laboratory and imaging tests that have been done, and did he do it in a timely fashion? Um, so it's about engagement of the physicians in the neighborhood. Got it. Those are the process measures. Outcome measures would be the, the, the complication rates. What, was the infection rate lowered? Was the readmission rate lowered? Was the ER visit rate lowered Got by it. the group? And, and, and who have you engaged in the early phases of this dialogue? Because it, it, when, when I look at it from the outside, it appears to be, um, it, it looks like Queens is creating a, a small healthcare universe of physicians to accompany its 1,200 staff physicians, of whom many are specialists and some are primary care. Uh, so you're creating this healthcare universe. Is it open to everyone in the state? It, it is, it is. And um, what we have done is uh, we've approached the IPAs or the physician organizations. And we um, approached uh, four major physician organizations because they Many of their members practice at Queens. Right. So your Hawaii right. IPA, yes. uh, Dr. Nadine Sally, has been very active in, in the planning process. Uh, Pacific uh, PMAG, yes. uh, Oahu Physician Group, and HQPO. Right. Those are the four physician organizations whom we have engaged, and uh, we're looking to them to supply the primary care base. Okay, well, I think this is a perfect place for us to take our second break, uh, now that we've explored kind of the fundamentals of the Queen C CIPN, but when we come back after our, our one minute break, I think we're going to dig really deep and ask ourselves what will happen for all the physicians in the state, how this will help patients, and how this matches up against some of the other uh, initiatives that we're seeing across our state. All right. Okay. All right. Well, then I'm going to take another break. I'm Josh Green, your host at Healthcare in Hawaii, and today we're happy to have Dr. Whitney Lim, transplant surgeon, and now Senior Vice President Queens, talking about the Clinically Integrated Physician Network. Thanks for joining us. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel with ThinkTech. ThinkTech is a 501c3 Hawaii nonprofit corporation. We began ThinkTech in the year 2000. At ThinkTech, we work to raise public awareness about tech energy diversification and globalism in Hawaii. We do 20 live stream talk shows every business day and we do a weekly TV show on OC16. We pay the bills with donations from our supporters. Won't you help us by making a donation? All you need to do is go to our website, thinktechhawaii.com and click there on the donate button. We hope that you like what we do and that you will support us and help us continue to do it. Thanks so much for watching and for helping. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, physician on Big Island, state senator. Today I have with me Dr. Whitney Lim, who's a transplant surgeon, but for purposes of discussion today is the senior vice president over at Queens in charge of clinical integration, which at first take seemed a little strange for a transplant surgeon to talk about clinical integration, the patient-centered medical, uh, patient centered medical home and medical neighborhood. But now I'm starting to get a bigger picture of what Queens is all about and what Whitney's all about. In our first two segments, we talked about Queens' new initiatives taking on transplant responsibility statewide and also taking on HMC West and possibly a hospital on Big Island going forward. We're now also seeing that the CIPN, which will be a clinically integrated physician network, 
will change the way healthcare is delivered here at our hospital at Queens and probably statewide. We're going to dig deeper into what the CIPN will look like, how it will bring doctors together, and how it might match up against, for instance, the Hawaii Pacific, Pacific Health Initiative and what Kaiser has done. So why don't we turn to our expert, Dr. Lim, and he can tell us maybe a little bit about uh, maybe first the role of what Kaiser's been like in the state and then what Hawaii Pacific Health is doing and then how that all looks like from the right. Queen's perspective. So I think um, uh, Kaiser has, uh, has uh, had a uh, integrated uh, system in place. They have the insurance company, the hospital, and, and the physicians aligned. Um, but they have a, it's a closed network. So um, you have to be a Kaiser member in right. order to, um, uh, to seek care at Kaiser. And um, uh, Kaiser physicians practice only at Kaiser. Uh, what Queens is doing is, is saying, look, we, uh, a, we're a wide open system. We have 1,200 physicians. We're expanding. We're going out to West. We would like to create a network that is inclusive. If you are a physician practicing in the community and you, are, you agree to follow our quality guidelines, then you're welcome to join us. Patients then will then have a choice to pick their physicians within the system. So this, this is very interesting. So historically we've had Kaiser, they've been around for a good long while. Uh, done a very good job. We, we all have friends at Kaiser and you know, I'm very fond of their CEO. Um, she does a great job, Janet Liang. Um, so people have been able to choose Kaiser Insurance, got Karen Kaiser like you said. And then we have now it seems to be two leaders in the state. We have Hawaii Pacific Health and we have Queens. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do have a very uh, important healthcare safety net in HHSC and the community health centers. But for um, the purposes of large institutional health care providers, it seems that two other leaders are emerging, yourself and Hawaii Pacific Health. How is this going to play out? I've heard uh, through the grapevine that Hawaii Pacific Health is also putting together a system uh, that's clinically integrated in its own right, a physician health organization. Right. How does that differ from the Queens right. CIPN? Um, my understanding is that the Kapiolani system is a uh, they're forming an ACO and they will have um, uh, uh, X number of lives attributed to them okay. and their uh, pop, their primary care physicians I believe are mostly going to be primary care physicians who are employed by their health system okay what's unique I think what makes Queen's uh, network different is that we're dependent on uh, community primary care physicians who m many of them want to be independent and so we're allowing them to celebrate their independence we're saying okay you you continue to be in, in private practice on your own but you come in as a member of a physician organization and you join us um, as an independent practitioner it, it's so so the distinguishing traits would be uh, Kaiser on the far end where you literally are employed and work for Kaiser period and only if people have Kaiser insurance do you get care in that system. Then a, a slight hybrid on that in some ways the Hawaii Pacific Health with a system where they will either employ many physicians or keep them very close mm -hmm. in their network and so they will have those physicians provide their primary care base to get care at the Hawaii Pacific Health Hospitals, but they will be tightly knit into that system. And then finally, Queens, which is saying, as long as you practice good medicine, right. we want to embrace your independence, bring you into our system, we'll work together, it's my understanding. And, and I'm, the next quest, series of questions I think I'm going to ask you are, are going to be about how you're developing the system and what kind of input you're getting from the docs. Uh, but Queens is much more uh, loosely affiliated saying, you can be independent. You can practice medicine the way you want. You don't have to be, quote, owned by our system. Instead, right. we want to be partners. Is that about That's right? That's right. In a way, I think all three of us are groups are working toward clinical integration, but the level of financial integration varies. Got right? it. You know, the Kaiser system is much tighter. Right. And then, so Kaiser would be the tightest. Yeah. White Pacific Health might be some kind of uh, variation of that fairly right. tight but Queens will say you still should remain independent but we are going to put together ways to bend the cost curve to achieve the triple exactly and it's Queens culture I think to uh, to uh, to allow this open staff uh, that's 
for 150 some years that's been the case. And I think it's to Queen's credit because I think you are taking a slightly in some ways riskier approach because without putting such tight rules on people you're allowing them to practice the way they believe mm -hmm. they would like to practice. On the other hand um, big costs could still ensue or people's independence um, will be their own independence. Mm -hmm. You won't be telling them exactly how to practice. Mm -hmm. But that brings us to the question now. Um, the CIPN, the Clinically Integrated Physician Network, is forming as we speak, basically. Like you said, even my own physician organization has been approached and his, uh, we've sent one of our, our board president to have those discussions with Queens. How are you getting input from doctors and how are we, how are we forming this? How is it going to have its rules built and uh, will the physicians make the decisions about what's best in this uh, CIPN or, or will it be more from the administrative level? Right. So uh, we've actually been working uh, on this uh, CIPN for over a year. The advisory council is made up of physicians. The board of managers, directors for the CIPN uh, will have nine members, um, seven are physicians, and then two representatives from Queens. And actually, I'll be one of the two. So we'll actually, there'll actually be eight out of uh, nine members who are physicians. Great. Um, what we've been doing is, uh, we've been working on quality metrics, and, and actually there's been multiple task forces. All of them are physician-led. Okay. So physicians have been actually driving this initiative with you at the helm, it appears. And you're putting together the, the best list of approaches to make healthcare more accessible, keep it at the top Queen's quality that we've all come to expect, but also now to perhaps rain in cost, right. waste, and inefficiency. Right. And so we've been working closely with HMSA, the payer. Got it. So what they're saying is, hey, look, if you can help us bend the cost curve and maintain the quality, we'll partner with you. And the physician's saying, okay, let's think about measure one, measure two, measure three, let's develop them. And for each of the measures, let's make sure it addresses the triple lane. Got it. It's so interesting because I think many of us as physicians in the community would agree that if you went back and harking back 10 or 15 years ago, these discussions weren't happening, no. uh, particularly before Mike Gold became CEO. And he's really done, a, I think, a pretty good job of reaching out to physicians, reaching out to the community and saying, at least he says this to me and, and, and I know you, uh, you tell us what uh, you need for your patients and we'll try to make the payment system from the insurance standpoint fit your healthcare needs, which that wasn't really a dialogue before. Before it seemed to be we physicians were concerned that we didn't get paid enough in our practices to keep our doors open and mm -hmm. take care of patients, and we would just see patient after patient after patient to mm -hmm. somehow make it work. Now the system's turned on its head. Now Queens is leading with physicians in partnership with HMSA. Mm -hmm. Right, and I would say Queens is working with the physicians and with, with HMSA. Um, I think Hawaii is unique in that when you look at physicians in, in their practice, there's a lot of onesies and twosies. Right. On the mainland, you know, you have m m many more physicians, larger percentage of physicians in groups. Right. Uh, but here, you've had people in solo practice. Patients love their physicians. So how do you make, uh, sustain a system where you have physicians who are in solo practice and that you have patients who love their physicians. Well, you've set up the you've set up a great approach. Then a great question for me to bring to you: um, the the CIPN is formed. Queens people out there might not even know it unless they see our show today. But uh, physicians have now let's look forward a year have joined Queens in their initiative to do this clinically integrated system. First of all, how will it change the lives of patients out there? Will they even know the difference or it will be through their doctor? Yeah, they may not know the difference. And frankly, it'll be fine if, if they don't know the difference. What we would like to see is that they um, have the outcomes that they expected right. and that it's a good outcome. And we would like to see that the, the spending for the care uh, is contained, the cost is contained. Um, and, and that the health of the population improves. So they may, they may not notice, but it was seamless, though, for a doctor out, uh, maybe not even on the Queens campus, that might be 15 or 20 miles away, joins the CIPN, but they have now uh, newfound ties with Queens and are able to more seamlessly access a surgeon like yourself or a nephrologist. Is that how it would right. work? Well, hopefully, uh, yes, access will improve, but um, additionally, um, we want 
the uh, patients who are cared by physicians in the network to be able to go from uh, one side of care to the next with information properly shared and done in a f timely fashion. Yes. And that, uh, when, that the, when the patient goes to the next level of care, um, that there's planning ahead of time. And if there's something unexpected that happens, that, there's, that, that preparations are made to, to uh, address that. That seems to underscore, I was going to ask you about that, what does Queens uh, essentially bring to the table? And uh, I think, like you said, many of these physician practices, which are just one or two doctors, you know, the onesies or twosies working out on their own, they don't have the capacity to have um, a lot of outreach support or yeah. electronic medical record support. Is that what Queens brings to the table? Yes. So uh, let's say that you want to send your patient to my office from the Big Island. Yes. And you know that um, yeah, you know, you've done X number of tests beforehand. We want to be able to have a system that allows you to transfer that information to me, even though we have different EMRs. Got it. You know, the, our, e, our electronic medical record systems may not speak the language. It would be Queen's job to make sure that it's translated, that the information is shared. And I have a, a similar thing. This is a, a little bit more um, uh, maybe, well, boy, it's even a ba more basic challenge that some of our docs have. I know docs that uh, only have their spouse, their husband or wife, working in the front of their office. They don't yeah. have a, a care coordinator. Right. Whereas Queen's would probably be able to bring some resources in that area, too. Right. Right, and so this may be a time for you to, for me to share, uh, give an example of what a patient-centered medical neighborhood can do for patients in a specific condition, with, with a specific uh, medical condition. Let's say someone has uh, an advanced illness. It may be advanced heart failure or uh, cancer. Yes. And this patient, you know, ideally should be cared for in a neighborhood that will allow him to have um, the care that he wants. Right. So if his care is to, if he says, you know, I don't really want to keep on going back to the hospital. I want to stay home and be comfortable. Then the network should be able to provide the nurses, the, the physicians who can allow him, who will allow him to stay home and be comfortable at home. It, it's so, I'm, I'm so pleased that you mentioned that because actually last week on our show we had the medical director for uh, Hospice Hawaii who um, we are in this program trying to express a newfound partnership for all of the pieces of the healthcare system. It happens to be that Queens is an extreme expression of that forming an actual, an actual clinically integrated system. But uh, that example you just gave would both help the patient and provide them extra abilities to reach out and get those either homes, home health care nurses or hospice teams directly right. involved. And right. I suppose it, some people would say, well, normally uh, it would have been in Queen's interest to provide inpatient care or maybe right. even a surgery. Now you're saying the system is different. You'll be providing... Right, I, I, right. And I think um, using the specific example of um, end-of-life care, I think that... Um, um, we sometimes provide care that is probably beyond what um, our patient's wishes are. Yes. And, and I think it's important for us to recognize that. Well, I'm so, it's so interesting to hear, you know, frankly, a decision maker and a senior vice president at a hospital system um, mentioning that in today's new healthcare climate, and it underscores how much change actually has happened in healthcare. Uh, Dr. Lim, I think we'll take our last break and then we'll come back um, for our last five or, or seven minute segment and talk about your vision for healthcare in the future going forward. Sound okay? Okay. Again, thank you for joining us at Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm Josh Green, your host and moderator uh, from the Big Island in the Senate. Thanks for coming today. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone Program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Aloha, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, 
a senator from the Big Island and emergency room physician. Today I'm joined by Dr. Whitney Lim, a homegrown uh, gentleman who went on to Stanford and UCLA for his training to become a transplant surgeon and is now a healthcare leader at Queens. Whitney's been talking to us about the CIPN, the Clinically Integrated Physician Network that's emerging out of Queens Hospital and their new approach to healthcare for our state. I want to turn back to Dr. Lim in our final few minutes and talk about how doctors will actually join up with the CIPN and then uh, ask him briefly about his vision for healthcare in the future. So Whitney, tell us briefly, how can doctors join the CIPN? Okay. What will be the process in the next few months? Well, um, what we would like the primary care physicians to do is to join our CIPN as a member of their physician organization or IPA. We, we very much respect what the P, uh, physician organizations have done for the primary care physicians and we want to maintain that relationship. Um, for the specialists, uh, we're asking them to join uh, independently or they can join through their IPA. Got it. And what we'll be doing is we'll be sending out contracts some um, in about two months to, to the physicians. We've been giving them uh, information. Uh, we've been update them, updating them monthly. So uh, we're heading into the new year. It'll be 2014 soon. Uh, physicians will begin to join, uh, typically through their physician organizations. What if a physician doesn't happen to be a part of a physician organization or is even on a neighbor, uh, a neighbor island? Uh, will they be able to join? Yes. Um, if you're a primary care physician and you don't belong to a physician organization, we'll encourage you to join one because they're organized to help the primary care physicians build their patient center of medical home. Um, and yes, neighbor island uh, physicians are encouraged to join. This, the care that we provide as a network is not limited to just to care provided in the hospital. It's about care provided across the state outside the boundaries of the hospital. And I gave the example of end-of-life care. Right, and, and I can certainly attest to that as an individual, as a guy who's every weekend in the emergency department up in on Big Island in West Hawaii. When I, when I see a patient and I know that they're gonna need additional care, it's very often Queens that I, I call on. Okay, so physicians will be part of their physician organizations. The physician organizations will join the Queen's network, this um, clinically integrated network. More services will go to those primary care providers. Uh, more resources will over time go uh, to the providers to help their patients uh, receive care. Uh, now we will see Queen's with its uh, very uh, vibrant and robust integrated system. We will see Hawaii Pacific Health with theirs and Kaiser. How will this uh, affect the healthcare system globally for the state? What do you right. see in the future? Um, I think um, there, there's definitely room for three systems to exist, and there, there are other hospital systems um, within the state that uh, are thriving. Um, <clears throat> I think what, what I would like to see is a state uh, where we continue to be the healthiest state um, in the country and that um, um, the cost uh, is uh, controlled, that uh, we're able to bend that cost curve. And you, and you envisioned, uh, you've spoken to me many times about this, that everyone deserves care. Uh, and Queens has always had an open door, no matter who the physician is or what the patient's needs have been, certainly as evidenced by you taking over the responsibilities of the transplant program. But do you envision communication between Kaiser and Hawaii Pacific Health? Will there be times when, um, Queens might do something better than one of the other hospitals, so they send one of their patients to you, and vice versa. Is that possible in the future? Yes, yes. Um, as an example, um, uh, Kapiolani provides excellent care for, for the kids yes. uh, and for uh, high-risk uh, uh, pregnant women, yes. and, and we have a transplant program. You know, uh, and so I, I think uh, each institution, each system will have some tertiary or, or sub, some uh, specialties where it excels at and it'll continue to provide those services. So what we're describing is uh, emerging leadership from Queens, from Hawaii Pacific Health and the, the continued leadership from Kaiser, but with centers of excellence here in our state so that when patients have the most serious need, uh, for instance, trauma, you've always been a leader right. in trauma. Queens has right. been really the penultimate uh, center for trauma here in our state. We all have pivoted towards bringing our, our most seriously injured patients to you. But there will be times when a, a very sick child, and I, I've experienced this on the neighbor islands, where uh, Capulani has immediately sent out a team to yes. grab that child. And right. so this new partnership is going to be 
even further enabled because there are more resources for people. Is that right? Yes, yes. And, and I think it would be a shame if, um, you know, we compete for services. I think it would be best uh, to, to not compete um, in some areas. I, I'm, so, I'm so pleased you say that. I think that's really probably a very good place for us to end today, which is to say Queens is taking a leadership role in integrated services, in integrated care, in outcomes-based care, but that doesn't mean we're going to be at each other's throats. Instead, we're going to be in the best interest of Hawaii, which is always the way yeah. Queens has led uh, for all the patients. Does that seem thank like you, a fair thank assessment? You. Okay. Thank you. I think we'll end there, but I really wanted to say uh, thank you to those of you who are watching our program. I was so excited to have Dr. Whitney Lim, who has many areas of uh, historic excellence as a transplant surgeon and now as a physician leader here in our state, explain to us what the Queen CIPN network is going to be like going forward. In future weeks, we'll bring on some of those other individuals, those from Kaiser and Hawaii Pacific Health, to also ex describe what their philosophy of healthcare and integrated healthcare in our state of Hawaii will look like, will look like, look like going forward. Again, thank you for joining me here at Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator and Big Island Emergency Room Physician. Take care.